Hello and welcome to Rollmaster Deep Dive Part 1. Why Part 1 you say? Can't we just do it all now? Well, Rollmaster is such a complicated and in-depth system. Unless you want to sit here for three hours in one go. No, I think we'll do it in bite-sized chunks so that I get a chance to make the material I need to show you and you can get a chance to actually get up and have a cup of tea. So, let's have a look. What's going to be in part one? First of all, I'm going to do a quick overview of the books. And then we're going to go into character creation, classes, and all those kinds of stuff. Cool. So, let's have a look at that. Role Master Deep Dive, part one. Yay! So, Role Master comes in three core books. Character Law and Campaign Law is actually one book. Arms and Claw Law and Spell Law. So what do the books have to say for themselves? Now, here's a really interesting quote. Rollmaster is designed as a complete system or as individual component systems. Okay. So already that's a bit confusing. What do you mean individual component systems? Well, it is suitable for experienced gamers who want guidelines and materials to inject into their existing game systems and worlds. So hang on a minute, let's just, just stop right there. So, not just into your existing world, into your existing game system. So, I don't know, I'm playing Call of Cthulhu. And you're now saying that I can take some of these individual component systems and inject them into my other system. And the answer to that is yes. That is something that's quite unique about Rollmaster is although as it says afterwards as well as for those looking for a realistic yet playable fancy role-playing system uh, or the first line it's a complete system although Rollmaster is a fully fledged system all in its own it's also a system that's there to say look if you like bits of this or you want to spruce up combat or add spells to an existing system then take bits out of this system so that's quite a strange way of looking at things. And also that bottom line, if you're looking for a realistic yet playable fantasy role-playing game, now that's quite important. As I said in my GMing rules uh, video, a realistic system is fantastic. That's, that's like the ultimate dream. I mean, if it was a computer game and we could all jump into virtual reality to the point whereby it was real, then you've just created basically the perfect design for a game where the whole world, the physics, everything is real. But that's not really practical, especially sat around a table rolling dice. That would just be too complicated. So what they've done, and as it says there, looking for a realistic yet playable fantasy role-playing game, it's very important. So you have to understand that concept when you're playing Rollmaster especially. It's trying to balance those two words, realism and playability. Now, you can use all kinds of optional rules to move things towards the playable side or towards the realistic side. It's up to you, but realize that sometimes going the one way can make the other be less. Okay, on top of that, they've, re they've also um, released just loads of companion books. Uh, there are seven core books that call themselves just companions with numbers after them. But then there's all kinds of other companions. You know, and on top of that, then there's like books like Firearms and, and Castles and Ruins. And they're still producing books for Rollmaster now. Um, I mean, there was a, a Shadow World, a uh, whole campaign world as well. They released stuff though. And you've also got the Space Master things. You've got like Future Law. And there's just so much material from Rollmaster. And as I said, they're still making it now. I do believe they've just released a book this month. Um, so this is fantastic. Uh, their system is all about optional rules so it's not like buying a book that says oh this is how you do dungeoneering or this is how you survive on top of a mountain no they say right here's a book and just for every page at the top of the page it says the magic words optional rules for and they are just that you can't actually add them all because some of them completely like change the way whole core system parts of the game works. 
you know, some things are usually sacrosanct in game systems like combat. Combat, quite often, it, for most game systems, is what the game system is. But in Rollmaster, it says, oh, okay, you, you want to use all these tables and critical roles, and that's fine. You want a fast combat where you don't use all of that, that's fine. You want to use action points to go down into the real, real fine details of how long it actually took your character to draw the sword and then make a swing and then look. I mean, it's got as much depth or as looseness as you wish. And the amount of optional rules it adds to the game are exactly that. It's just do what you want to tailor the game the way you want to play it. Now, in the 80s, when this came out, this was quite a revelation to me as a player and as a GM and as a future game designer myself. It basically said to me, hang on a minute, what I'm buying isn't what it says in the, in the, in the book. That's a framework. And as Rollmaster says, it's just change whatever you want. Add in all kinds of things. And that was great. That's what I love about Rollmaster is the fact that there is no one way to play Rollmaster. If somebody says to you, okay, this is uh, how you play Rollmaster, well, then they can't. It's not possible. So many of the rules actually contradict each other. You, you couldn't say how you play Rollmaster. Um, what they can do is here's a really good Rollmaster framework and we brought in optional rules so that we play it in a way that we want to play it to give you a good idea how Rollmaster works. But there is no one way to play Rollmaster. Uh, it's not that kind of system. So let's go into something that everybody wants to know, the basics. Character stats is probably about as basic as you get when you're creating a character. The things you roll that tell you how cool your character is. Let's have a quick look at the character stats in Rollmaster. Constitution, yeah, that's a straightforward one. Agility. Some of you are probably thinking dexterity straight away. Um, and yes, it is your hand-eye coordination, but it's not how fast you can move or how well you dodge. That's a different thing. Self-discipline. Yes, your ability to mind over matter. Keep on running. Go on, you can get to the end of that marathon. Yes, get up off the floor. Don't lay there and die. Cool stuff like that. Memory. Can I remember what I'm going to say next on this video? It's a good thing. Um, some people can have really low memories um but have great analytical minds and vice versa uh, so the other one for what normal game systems i would say would probably class as intelligence um these do split them out and say no reasoning is is a, a thing separate from memory being analytical has nothing to do with uh, your ability to remember stuff and vice versa um oh it says come on why have you made that green I'll come to that in a moment, but let's go through the rest of the stats first. So strength, obvious one. Quickness, well, there's your ability to move around and dodge things that we were talking about with the agility. Presence, some people walk into a room and they just have it. They, everybody just stop and look at them, or they can just be the focal point of a conversation. Um, they're the it kid in school. I mean, some people just have presence. There's, yes, it's charisma, but it's, it's not... It's not just charisma, it is just that, their natural ability, they don't have to say anything. Intuition, your ability to intuitively know what to do, um, where to look, when to duck, all kinds of things. Empathy, yeah, anything with any kind of um, intelligence, I suppose, you can be empathic towards uh, and try and relate to. And then I've added an extra one on the bottom. Some people play with this as an optional extra, others don't, it's fine. Um, I add it as an 11th stat that I roll separately with an 11th separate roll that doesn't have anything to do with the primary 10. For those people that want to have a gauge of how attractive their character is to their own race. Now, in some games like Dungeons and Dragons, you get things like charisma. They can get very confusing. In some people use it as a, oh yeah, how charismatic you are is how beautiful you are. But then charisma in Dungeons and Dragons is not really about that. It's actually about presence. Um, so beauty is a very strange thing. And then it's quite strange when you start thinking about, well, just because you're beautiful to your race, are you beautiful to a different race? So it is a complicated stat. But for those who want an appearance stat, I do let them have an appearance stat. So what's next? Okay. This is actually a cutout from the, the the book. I'm not going to do too many of them because, hey, I mean, go buy the book. Um, but this is just going to explain to you 
the stats and something very unique in the way that Roll Matter does stuff. So you can see here that on the first column, 1 to 100. Now, Roll Master does stats as D100s. So they are from the range of 1 to 100. Although, like the table there, even it says there's 1 to 100, it does say 101, 102 plus. And actually, in one of the companions, it goes higher than that. I'm not going to explain how to get those in this video. So, but it's also got loads of other columns. So what the hell's going on here, you ask? Well, let's look at these three very interesting columns they have here. Bonuses on D20, 3 to 18 stat, 2 to 12 stat. What's that all about? Well, as, as Rollmaster says from the get-go, it's not just about itself. It basically tries to say, look, if you want to incorporate things into your own system, but your own system might not be a D100. It might be a 3 to 18. Well, then it says, well, this is what your role now means if you're going to do a 3 to 18. Or if you want to change a character that you have in a 3 to 18 system to role master, well, you can kind of also look back across and go, well, this means you're somewhere like this. This is where your stats actually are on a role master basis. So even from the get go, role master doesn't say this is the system and tough. It's our system and live with it. It, it straight away it says no this is how other systems work and this is how ours work and this is the comparison but there's something in the middle there called development points now these are how many skill points you get to spend on skills and those white skill um, stats that are listed constitution agility self-discipline etc they are the ones that generate you development points so yeah, you can stick loads into, say, strength and quickness. Those have always seem to be great, and they? I want to have loads of strength, and I want to be super dodgy. Well, you can, but you're going to get no development points if you do that. And then you say, well, hang on, what about this power points column? Well, power points are all generated from the three magical stats, which are presence, intuition, and empathy. Um, some classes require one of those, some two, and some one class requires all three. And those are all, yet again, in the green area. So you're going to get no development points from those either. So saying you're going to stick your best, highest stats all in that top white area to give you skills is not necessarily very good. And sticking them all into the green area is equally not very good. So you need to think about planning your character out as to where you stick your stats. You can't just grab like lots of juicy bonuses because you're going to have negatives somewhere else. Let's have a quick look then. So at the top of my page, I say temporary and potential. Tell me what are you talking about? In Role Master, your stats start off as how they were on like day one. You've not necessarily a child yet, although Role Master does allow you to have a level zero and then you can spend points towards being level one. Um, but it's basically saying, right, as you are sat there watching this video, you have got a certain amount of stats about you right now, but they're not your potential. You could be better th than you currently are. You could be stronger, faster, fitter, whatever. So, in Rollmaster, you roll a set of stats. Now, you could do this in multiple ways. I've done it in, I've just rolled them and just assigned them as I rolled them. But you can, of course, roll a set of 10 and allocate them as you wish. It's up to the GM to decide how you're doing your rolling system and whether to ignore low numbers I, know, I got a nice 22 down there in my quickness hey <laughs> fantastic but you also have to roll a second set so i rolled the second set uh as you can see there i got a crack in 100 there on my strength and i've also got a 08 on my agility fantastic so you think, well, hang on a minute. How are these my potential, if that's what they are? Because how can I have a potential of 0, 8 on my agility if I've got, already got 75? These numbers don't make sense. And that's because what you do now is this second set of numbers, you actually look up on a table. And that table tells you what your potential is going to be based on what your temporary currently is. So you end up with a set of numbers like that. So the first two, you think, oh, this is obvious. And 87 is the highest of those two. And 75 is the highest of those two. Then you can see by the pink ones, no, hang on, that gets confusing now because the next one's a 77. How does that equate? And what the system is basically trying to say is, look, your second roll is not 
if it's higher than the previous roll. It's a, a waiting, a 1 to 100 waiting on how much improvement could be done to your current temporary stat. So if you rolled over 50, then clearly you're asking for a high waiting. But if your temporary stat was rubbish to start with, even rolling a low number, like if you look into intuition, I rolled 45, which isn't very good. Then my potential, I rolled 31, which is equally not very good. But it still comes out as a 59. Okay, pretty average kind of intuition. But that's the point. It's basically trying to do a weighting to evaluate how good your potential could be. So on your character sheet, you actually write down these two columns, your temporary and your potential, and not that second role. Now, when you go up levels, you actually gain points on your temporary until they reach their potentials. And they can also go down. If you roll a 0, 1 to 0, 4, it can actually drop by double that amount. But let me just give you guys an optional rule which I use. And the optional rule is quite simple. In real life, stats actually go down on, on certain reasons why they would go down. They go down on stress, injury, trauma, lack of use, confidence, survival. I mean, survival, I mean, if you've got no food, your body's going to actually start cannibalizing your whole physical structure to try and keep itself alive. Uh, an imbalance. I mean, if I go down to the gym and I do power training all the time until I'm mega powerful, I will potentially lose an awful lot of quickness. Um, and sickness. Now, what I do in the game is say, look, if I, in real life, when, yes, yet again, let's do the whole gym thing. Let's go down to the gym. I don't get sick. I don't overtrain. I don't suffer any injury or trauma or anything like that. Then, I'm actually going to continue to gain as long as my technique is good and I know what I'm doing. Uh, I'm going to continue to gain. So what I say is, look, guys, when we're playing, and this is an optional rule that adds a lot more paperwork and micromanagement, but so each, each GM takes that as they wish. Uh, what, I, what I say is, look, is if your character suffers a serious injury, say his character gets a broken leg, I'm going to flag your stats as potential loss stats. Uh, if you fail resistance rolls, if you suffer poison, it's a whole range of reasons why I'm going to flag stats to say that when you go up a level, they are now open to go down. They can actually decrease. You have suffered a broken leg. It's absolutely fine that when you go up a level and you roll a 0 2, you've lost four points of temporary strength or quickness, or whatever it's going to be. That's fine. That makes absolute sense as far as i'm concerned but a character that has been the hero all the way through nothing's gone wrong everything's been fine they've been training they've been practicing and getting better goes up a level and then potentially every single stat could go down by eight that to me just just means that you need to sit down and think slightly more as a gm and go well there needs to be a reason why that happened uh and the player needs to know why that happened other than the rule said so. So anyway, there's an optional rule there if you if you wish to use it. Races. Okay, so you're sat there now thinking about, okay, I want to create a character. What do I want to do? I first need to know what races there are. What races are in the world? What can I play, GM? I've got an idea in my head, but does it work? And that's a very good question. A quote from the books. It says, racial characteristics for a fantasy role-playing game are heavily dependent upon the world system being used. A game master should determine which races are appropriate for his world system as well as incorporate additional races. Now, that says it all in a nutshell. Your world might not have, I don't know, acrobatic super ninja monkeys or, I don't know, dragonborn or whatever it is that somebody wants to play. If your world doesn't go it, then it's not any. It's as simple as that. And you might be offering only to, to the players look guys this campaign is all about playing a group of gnolls i've done that before then you're playing gnolls okay whether you want to play a gnome you're playing gnolls and that's the end of it or you're playing trolls and that's what you're playing now in the this in in this system it gives you some opening races in the character law and these are very much lord of the rings based 
uh, a common human, a high human, which is like your Aragorn. Um, you've got you know, a mass of elves, your wood elves, you know, high elves, fair elves, dwarves, halflings, and then several forms of rip, goblin or orcs, lesser, greater. So that's quite limited. I mean, there's no gnomes or anything else in there straight away. You're saying, well, hang on a minute. I want to, you know, I want to add other races. Well, that's fine. There's lots of monster manuals and creatures and treasures and stuff that come out with Rollmaster. And in those books, they give some really good stats to what various races would have. And of course, you can make your own. I mean, once you get experience enough, making a new race is, is not difficult. Um, so add and take away whatever you wish. Don't be limited by the opening list. The opening list, as it says on that quote, is very much just a, here's some races. But there are some unique things in Rollmaster about races that, let's have a look. Soul departure. Now, that's an interesting concept. What that basically says is when your character is dead, so you've either received a hit that basically says you're dead, or you run out of hit points and you're dead, are you actually dead at this point? And the game says no. Your soul, depending on what race you are, can like basically refuse to leave your body for quite some time and just hang around. Um, one of the best ones for this is a common human. The common human, their soul will just sit there for ages saying, look guys, if you can repair this body and start the old CPR and all the rest of it, yeah, I can wake up and carry on. Um, as we're on the other hand, an elf, for example, nah, the moment their body ceases to be able to support life, gone. The soul's just gone. Off it goes. So how much you need to start doing your whole raise deads and bringing characters back from the dead can really depend on what race you've picked and what soul departure they've got because a soul departure, a uh, high soul departure allows people to have a lot more scope to come in and give you things like life keeping herbs we'll come into them later that can force your soul to be bound to it is where an elf to try and catch an elf when he takes a death critical and give him a life keeping herb that's almost impossible because the time you get to him he's gone next healing rate well there's an interesting concept um you might be a super hard warrior but you might take ages to heal <laughs> Um, so yeah, I mean, a perfect example of that, I suppose, would be a troll, uh, the classic troll, the healing rate on a troll is very fast. So what they've got for races is some races just heal naturally quicker than others. Um, so that's an interesting thing to keep in the back of your mind. Yeah, your character's taken a bunch of wounds, but do you need to take several weeks or will a few days be enough? Maximum hit points. Now there's a concept for game systems that use hit points. They're basically saying, right, I don't care the fact that, you know, your umpteenth level, your level 50, because levels in Rollmaster, they can go up really high. So yeah, I'm a level 50 fighter. That means that I've got tons of hit points. And the answer is no. Your race, your physical bone and muscle structure can only actually give you so much protection in combat. If a dragon falls on you, I don't care whether you're level 50 or not. You've only got so many hit points you can physically have in that form before it just goes splatter. Um, so they cap it. You get to a point whereby there's no point developing more hit points for your character because you can't have any more hit points for your character. Um, so that's an interesting concept on the all hit point issue of creating these ridiculous characters that just got loads of hit points that just seem to be immune to everything, they cap them and say, no, as a, an elf or a human, where is, you've got a set amount of maximum you can possibly have. Classes. So at this point, you're going to expect me to go, okay, Tone, can you show us, um, show us the classes? Yeah, I want to, want to decide what I'm going to be. I've got a character in mind. I want to know what class is in this game system. Well, um, in traditional game systems, classes mean what I can do. So this concept you have in your head is, yeah, I've got a character idea that's going to be like Legolas and it's going to shoot loads of arrows, or I want to be like Conan, Barbarian, so I want to see what classes I've got. Rollmaster doesn't work like that. Rollmaster says, you can do anything. It's just how much is it going to cost you? 
just like eh? what do you mean cost me and and this is a concept that you need to get in your head straight away when you're creating a role master character is don't be limited by classes or structure come up with a concept in your head of what is it you want to play and if you want to do a stereotype from an existing film or something that's fine think about that stereotype and go right that's what i want to play how how much is it going to cost and which class do i take that best fits that cost you can do it as any class but some classes are obviously going to be cheaper and we'll, we'll come to that now one of the first questions you're probably going to ask yourself though is am i going to be able to use magic that's quite an important thing people ask themselves when they're creating a character how am i going to relate to magic so let's have a quick scan over magic first in role master now magic comes in three sections essence essence is your typical dungeons and dragons arcane casting fireballs you know all your elements and all that kind of thing it sucks the energy from the world around or the realm as such um taps into the spaces beyond realms and messes a bit with the, the physical world in a weird kind of way Channeling would be the divine casting in something like Dungeons and Dragons, whereby you're saying, I don't potentially have all this power. I'm gaining my power from another source, like a deity. In Role Master, it's a little bit more in depth and complicated than that. So, yes, first, you could just be a deity. But it can be anything where you could channel power from. Um, it could be like earth nodes or ley lines or even other characters. So if you've got somebody else in the party that their chosen realm is channeling and they have trained in channeling their power to or from themselves, then two of you in the party with those same abilities could actually pass each other power uh, and you would channel that energy between yourselves. So channeling, yes, it does mean you, you gain your power from somewhere else as such but it'll, it's a bit more complicated than that there's more depth to it mentalism now straight away some of you might be going oh that's sonics and it's like well yes and no um role master describes mentalism quite well it describes mentalism as the power of the gods but you are not gods you're just mortals so it's very limited with you so what does that mean now mentalism is the ability through your personal ascension i suppose to literally will something into happening now to start with you could understand okay if i'm willing my body to heal faster you can potentially get your head around that it's a your force of will but it can mean more that you could actually exert your will on the world around you um if you had enough power <coughs> excuse me power you could will something into being that's a bit like x-men i suppose whereby some of their powers could be classed as just pure mentalism it's their ability to will something to be there so it is um so this is three realms you go okay so what's next <laughs> spells spells in role master actually fall into three categories open close and base Let's start at the bottom so you can understand what I mean. A base spell list is something that is guarded and protected by a certain class. So if you played as Magicka, I suppose, or game systems whereby you had certain houses, then those houses would protect things that they considered to be theirs, their secret knowledge. Now, those secret knowledges tend to be the most powerful they can do fireballs at much lower levels etc they they really do have some great powers in those base lists now it depends on what the gm wants to do and it's up to his own game world whether or not those lists could be acquired by other people whether that meant they get hunted down remember the me means that the person that taught you gets hunted down by his order and and you know um put the justice for for training somebody else uh it, it's completely up to you they could just be if you're not of that or um class you can't even comprehend them so closed is what's next they're not as powerful as base 
but they are what would be classed as spell lists that can be learned outside of those core classes. So just because you're not a healer doesn't mean that you couldn't learn a close list. But usually close list is something that um it's not natural ability, it's something that has to be learned. And I would I would describe them as if I was a magician, a Majors Guild, and we had our secret stuff, we would create a second load of lists that are kind of almost as good as our list, but not quite. And then we would sell those spell lists to people or allow people to come in at a cost to read those books in our library. So that's what a closed list is. It's not quite as good as based, but they're open to everybody to a certain degree. So what is an open list? An open list is things that you can just do if you are a fighter and you say well i'm never going to go and ask somebody to teach me something um but i want to learn a few tricks myself whether that's some magical healing whether or not i want to be able to cast a shock bolt at somebody that's fine you can learn these yourself you can master these yourself as a character you just put points in spell this acquisition and you pick up open lists open lists are weaker than closed they you need to be a much higher level in them to be able to pull off some of the things you could do in a closed um but they're there they're spell lists that are open to everybody so everybody every class could learn an open list if you wished so well you're getting confused now you say well hang on a minute i can be wherever i want i can cast wherever i want what's the point of classes i don't kind of understand their, their concept and so you say, okay, well, what else do you want to do as a class? You want to be able to fight? Stealth? Mobility? Climbing? Acrobatics? Tumbling? I want to be knowledgeable. I want to be able to craft stuff. Oh, detecting traps and all that kind of thing. Oh, social. I want to have diplomacy or gambling. I want to be a beastmaster. I want to tame pets and train them up. I want to have healing that's not magical. I want to be able to put people together and give them hit points without using spells. I want to be great at survival. I want to do all that tracking and retracking and all that kind of stuff. Surely classes must limit me in this way. And the answer is, well, yes and no. If you want to be a mage that can fight, be a mage that can fight. There's, there's no limit. There's a cost. So let's have a look. What do I mean? You keep saying costs. So here's a bunch of skills. I just picked to kind of give you an overview. So when I say like weapon choice one, two, and three, what I mean is like, yeah, I'm going to have, I don't know, a long bow is my favorite weapon or bows. I want to have swords as another type of weapon I like, but I also want to be able to be good at, I don't know, thrown weapons. And then you've got like spell lists, which means learning spells, detecting traps, first aid. Body development is more hit points. I want more hit points, please. And then you've got moving in armors. Yes, you have to train to get rid of the penalty on armors. There's a whole nother penalty for casting spells through armor, so don't, don't, don't mix these two up. And ambush is like kind of a thief, extra damage kind of thing. And then some laws and training. So what does this mean? Okay, so I've put three stereotypical classes there. And already you can see some things in green and some big fat 20 sat there looking at you thinking that doesn't look good. So let's have a look at the top one. Fighter. A fifth. It's like, no, Tone, that's not a fifth. It's one slash five. What this means is, it means I can train twice in it in a single level. I can spend one development point for the first time I train in it. But if I wish, I can spend a further five development points to train in it twice in a single level. Now, training things twice in a, in a level is something you want to be doing on what is your primary focus for your character. Things that you should be able to do. Um, like if you're a fighter, fighting would be good. Then training twice is, is a good move. Now, as you can see, for the fighter, his second and third choices, yeah, okay, they're a bit more expensive, but they're not that much more different than their first choice. It's where for the thief, and let's not talk about the mage, the thief, you can see on his third weapon choice, it just says four. So it said three slash eight, so I can train twice. But on the next one, it said four. And that means you can only train once per level. Doesn't matter any points you've got spare and you want to train in that 
extra weapon or whatever it is, you can. You get to train once and once only. So let's look at spell lists a minute. So for my fighter, it says 20. And it is a single number. That means I get to train once per level. And it costs me just a huge amount of points. And by the way, for spell lists, one training actually means 5% chance of getting that spell list, that level, and I don't get to roll again until next level. Um, so, yes, training spells as a fighter, maybe not your best choice. Um, the Thief on a 10, still really expensive, but at least it's half as expensive as the fighter. But the Magician says one asterisk. What does that mean? And the asterisk basically says, you can train as many times as you like at that single cost. So if you want to train 10 times for 10 points, yeah, that's fine. So you can see straight away, the magician, he's not going to pick up much in the way of weapons. He might pick up one weapon choice, weapon choice one at the cost of nine, just so he can maybe use a sword or something, be a bit gandalf -y and stand there with his sword in combat. Um, but when it comes to spells, yeah, he's going to, he's nothing without the spell lists. So he can pump a lot of points into spell lists to make sure he gets spell lists. And as you can see, as you go down through the list, that's how it kind of flows, is the example I've given here. And that's how every class actually works. So get yourself a concept in your head as to what you want to do, what you want to be, then have a chat with your GM to say, look, what class is going to be the best fit? Don't make the, the class limit you. Don't say, oh, well, he said the class that's the best fit is a bad. Well, that means I'm going to be casting, like, you know, sing-song songs and I'm going to play the guitar. Well, not at all. If that means that those end up being the class that gives you the best spread for the way you want to develop your character, then, then do that. Don't worry about the title of the class. Um, it's just that some classes come with base lists, and if you want to use spells, then clearly what base lists are going to be very important to you. Okay, let's move on. Oh, one more thing. Say I've rolled my stats, and I want to play a character in this example on the screen. I want a character that wants to have a high quickness and a high intuition. But I've rolled terrible stats for my quickness and intuition. I've got a 22 in my quickness and a 45 in my intuition. And even my maximum for my intuition is a 59. I can't really play this class, can I? I mean, this is why I wanted to play. This is the whole reason for playing this game. I sat there, I had this idea for a character, and now I can't play it. Well, Rollmaster doesn't do that to you. Rollmaster says, right, each class has got prime attributes, and the prime attributes for that class you can, if you wish, change those attributes to be 90s on your temporary. Boom, straight 90s. And as you can see here, now I've got 90 in quickness and intuition. And hey, even my potential for my quickness can be 95. That's fantastic. So why am I just doing that? Why am I not just sat there going, right, I'm going to stick my lowest rolls in my prime attributes. And then -da, my lowest rolls suddenly become 90s. Hey, I've got a great stat. And the answer to that is this. The difference between a 90 and a 100 is huge. In Dungeons and Dragons terms, a 90 is a plus 2. As we're 100, I think it's a plus 5. So that gap of those last 10 points is where all of your bonuses are going to come in. They're really important. So giving yourself a 90 is basically saying, yeah, you can quite ad adequately play this class. This class is fine, but you're not what would be considered the most spectacular of that class. You're not those few chosen masters of the class that have ridiculously high stats. So you have to try and decide whether or not to put your best stats in your primary and really push your class to its edge, or whether or not, because of the stats you roll, to sit there and go, well, I'm going to have to put something low in one of my primaries and let it become a 90. The game still allows you to play your character just as you wished. It's just, yeah. It's a nice little tweak that it gives you to alter your stats. It's very good. So, you're probably sat there going right now. Okay, so you've kind of discussed what classes mean and races. 
and you've mentioned cost of skills, but you haven't shown the skills. Why haven't you shown the skills? Where are the skills? And the answer to that is very simple, folks. If I go through all of the skills in Rollmaster, this one video will be three hours long in itself. So I'm just going to show you now the skills up until Companion 2. <laughs> yeah, there's loads more skills after that, guys. Um, and when you even look at these skills, you've got to realize that some skills like directed spells or spell mastery are actually on a per spell basis. So they could just be pages and pages and pages of spell uh, skills. So I'm not going to go into them all. But I am actually going to give you a quick word of advice before I go and end this video. And that is... Not all skills in any game now, this is not just one master in any game, not all skills are going to be relevant to a campaign or even the way that GM wants to do stuff. I mean, if you've taken advanced maths, like I see on there, advanced maths, and you put points in there, and I am never, ever going to ask you to roll that, then I've just wasted some very, very valuable points that you have made you put them in, or let you put them in skills that will never ever be used. Now, that's not fair, not fair to the player at all. So I always sit there as a GM and think, right, if there's skills that are not going to be used in my game world, then I'll let you know. And I'll probably, for advanced maths, I might say, okay, I'll just get you to make a reasoning roll. Um, so there's other ways to, to deal with some things, but the once... In a whole campaign, you might roll a skill. Um, it's not something you should be encouraging characters to train in because that's just, just not fair for points. And other systems might be fine. I mean, because you can use Roll Master in any setting, you could put some parts of Roll Master, especially future uh, you know, Space Master parts, as part of, say, a Netrunner campaign that you're running, in which case, advanced maths and programming and things would be really things that you would probably roll on a regular basis um but in a fantasy setting i mean perception is is a good one um your combat skills obviously but yeah there might be stuff in here you want as flavor like singing or tale telling you might want to have that on your character because you want to have opportunities where you say to the gm no i'm gonna be in this tavern and i'm gonna do some tale telling or whatever and see if i can make some money or scare the audience or Whatever it is I want to do. That's absolutely fine. But getting people to train in heraldry, if there's no heraldry in your campaign world, is just a waste of everybody's time. Anyway, thank you very much. This is the end of part one. I will do a part two, which is going to go into combat, which is such a wonderful thing in Rollmaster. Um, so I hope you enjoyed this, and I will see you all for part two.